Good afternoon. I'm Austin Davis, uh, Director of Government Affairs with the Lake Champlain Chamber, your friendly local regional chamber of commerce with a knack for nurturing prosperity in our local economy. And uh, this particular uh, Live at 25, 525 broadcast, we're going to be talking about housing. And to talk about housing, I brought on Troy Bachman, who is the director of uh, the Northwest Vermont Realtors Association. And uh, she is really uh, just, if you want to talk for an expert on our region's housing, you could find no better person at this point in time. Wow, but, what a huge compliment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't think, if, unless you're living under a rock, um, it's not hard to see that there's some issues around housing in our region. And at the chamber, we speak with many businesses every day. And it's really noticeable that it's the limiting factor in most of uh, our economic endeavors. And it really every pursuit, um, you know, it's, it's issues with staffing and our healthcare systems and other essential services. It's preventing uh, growth of, of some businesses. And, you know, we're seeing a lot of incredible things in our regional economy despite this. However, we could do much better and we need to do much better. Um, so I'm really happy to have Troy on the program here today to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the state of play and, and some things we can look forward to. But thanks for joining. Why don't you tell us a little bit about y yourself and the organization? Sure. So thanks for having me on. Um, as Austin mentioned, my name is Troy Bachman. I am the CEO of the Northwest Vermont Realtor Association. Um, we are a trade association representing realtors. We've got about 700 members. Um, and we, our service area is Chittenden, Franklin, and Grand Isle counties. So most of our realtors um, are serving that area. Of course, many of them do business throughout the state. Um, and we are a part of a broader coalition of realtors across the nation. Um, so our focus is really um, training for our members, education, and allowing them to provide the best service to clients. Um, and with that, that requires some understanding of our market and what's happening with that. Um, so glad to talk, dive in and talk about, you know, a little bit what's happening if you want to go into that. Yeah, you sent me a really enlightening r report uh, a day or a couple days ago when we decided we're going to set this up. and. Um, yeah, just tell me a little bit about that. And this is something you're doing on a regular basis and yeah. provides some great insight into what's happening in our market. Sure, so I'm gonna plug the Vermont Association of Realtors. Um, they provide amazing market statistics for us through a firm called Domus Analytics. Um, and this is available for all of our realtor members. Um, so one of the reports that we see um, on is, is about the median sales price and we're always kind of looking at that. And we all know anecdotally that Housing prices are, are going up, um, wages maybe not matching that, and that can be really challenging. So right now we see the median sales price across Vermont for all types of properties. So condos, land, single family, um, all types of, of residential properties um, is about $375,000. Now, when we zoom in on just Chittenden County, that number goes up. Um, which is not surprising, like, like we're one of the biggest um, metropolitan areas in Vermont and the median sales price in August 23 was $534,000. Um, and that was just for single family homes. So um, we can see, um, and, and the graph you're seeing on our screen is tracking the median sales price um, over time. So you can see like there are some dips every now and then and that's natural with uh, any type of free market, but um, we can see that that's going up and up and up, um, which has led to a lot of concern about how Vermonters are going to afford housing. Certainly, and it's not as if it's an easy time. And we're all seeing inflation across the board, not just in housing, uh, eat away at, at wages, and uh, we're at a time when student loans are resuming payment. Um, you know, what are some other factors at play for folks? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic um, caused sort of a nominal influx of people into Vermont. Um, other things at play is a historic uh, shortage of building supply. Um, and that's not just from the most recent sort of pandemic issues, but that stems all the way back to 2008. Like 
the initial Great Recession, the initial Great Recession, the recession, as if there were only one, yeah. um, the one in 2008, you know, the housing industry kind of screeched to a halt for a while mm -hmm. um, in terms of building. So we're already working from a stunted supply. Um, and so, I, you know, it's not just a Vermont issue, it's a nationwide issue. Um, so yeah, we've got the inflation, we've got student loans, a lack of supply, and then um, contributing to our supply issues, of course, is Act 250. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, so there's, there's obviously some things that are specific to Vermont, too. Um, we have a 50-year-old land use policy that hasn't seen much in the way of updates throughout its time. It was created at a time when we didn't have an agency of natural resources and very little local planning and zoning. So it, it had a, certainly had a purpose at that time. We've only added to it ever since. And so I think that's something we'll, we'll probably want to get into in a little bit about some chances to reform it. Um, we also have a really old housing stock mm, in mm -hmm, this state. Can, mm -hmm. you, can you talk a little bit more about that? I certainly live in one of those old houses. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, um, I live in a house from, what, 1905? Um, and again, that kind of stems from the, d the challenges in development, the labor shortages of like finding people to work on your house mm -hmm. um, if you can't do it yourself. Um, yeah, it, we have a, definitely have an aging housing stock. And again, we can kind of look at some of the regulations and, you know, that's not the only reason, but it certainly doesn't help in trying to generate new supply. Um, and then another factor, um, again, we see this nationwide, but specifically in Vermont, is we have an old, older population. Yeah. Um, and people are living longer, more independently. Um, staying in their homes staying longer. Staying in their homes longer. Um, and especially if you've locked in a 2.5 interest rate, or mm. maybe you've paid off your house, maybe you, you don't have a mortgage payment at all, there's not a lot of incentive to move right now yeah. um, and downsize because um, that's an issue that we see as well of like we do have an older person maybe looking to, to downsize, but where are they going? They don't have properties to downsize to. Yeah, we really do have an issue with um, housing at the entry and exit point of mm -hmm. the market. Um, you know, there, it's, it, there are folks who are older, who are in larger homes that could probably be more suitable to young families. They might be empty nesters at this point. They're in retirement. Um, and, you know, they're, as you said, probably paid off the margin and whatnot. But it's hard to find something that actually makes sense for them if they're going to sell this home to then put what equity they have in that and have some extra for retirement. Um, you know, that price that you put on the screen there, 425 Sure, they could sell their home, but where are they going to move to? Where are they going to move to? Yeah, that is the question on everybody's mind. And I know for our members, a lot of people are having to kind of get creative with the housing options that they're helping people find. Like more and more we're seeing um, young families buy multifamily, um, like duplexes and quadplexes when they can find them um, mm -hmm. and renting out part of that. And that's a wonderful option. Um, and that middle housing point of like, it's not necessarily a single family home, but it's not a big apartment complex is something that I think our market could really use more of. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all, it's already all through the downtown area. Like we already see it. Um, and I think sometimes there's like resistance to the idea of let's put some, some duplexes or some quadplexes. Um, but that already exists. It's just old. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong, I don't think, with building more of that. One, it's a great place for our, a great opportunity for the young professionals in the state to start building some equity and cementing some roots here. Two yep. things that I think are very difficult for this generation, especially with a older population in our state. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure it's no surprise to anybody watching this, I'm not from around here. I'm from the South. I, was, I moved up um, last summer. Um, and part of the conversation you alluded to this in the, your opening was like, my association had, we, I had to work remotely for a while while I tried to find housing. Mm -hmm. um, and with an aging population and uh, inflation increasing and causing the dollar to go further, taxpayers are often on the hook for that. Um, so our nice, all the nice services we get for our taxpayer dollars, um, we need more people here yeah. in order to keep the tax burden where it is as opposed to increasing that. And I think that's an important point. I mean, I think much of our conversation around uh, 
development of new housing in our state has consistently been one about growth mm -hmm. and an underlying idea that growth is bad. Um, and I think we're at a point where, especially because we've suppressed growth for so many years, um, you know, we need, we absolutely need growth. Without growth, we're going to collapse. Mm -hmm. um, we're not, you know, right now, one in five Vermonters is over 65. It's coming soon to one in four. And, you know, you're not going to have the, the, the hospital staff, the emergency staff, the, you know, the folks who can work on these old houses uh, if we don't do something and do something soon. And then also, uh, we're not going to have the tax base to support all the services these older folks need. So growth is necessary. And, um, you know, we're not seeing new units come online. And I think you had some data on that, too. Or you had a, or no? Um, well, oh, yeah, yeah, I can talk about the monthly supply, sorry. Yeah. Um, so right now our market has um, about 2.1 months supply of inventory, which means it would take 2.1 months for us to sell anything residential that is on the market. Um, that doesn't account for new construction, that's like what is existing, mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, sort of thought of a healthy market depending on like where you are in the nation is anywhere from like a healthy housing market has four to six months at least mm. on the market and the numbers aren't lying like we've only got two months yeah. um which can be kind of scary right because if you've got if you're a realtor or you're someone looking for a house um it feels very um nerve-wracking to be like okay well this is what we have um there's probably not anything new coming on in the next, you know, 24 hours or whatever. So there's it, the pressure on first-time home buyers, um, the pressure on people looking to find um, something a little different for their housing needs is really high. And it really is all housing needs too. Um, you know, really, what we're talking about is when we're at that level of inventory, just slowing down all turnover and all churn in the market, right? Right. Um, and so. You know, we're even talking about our, our folks who are unhoused in our state. Mm -hmm. And I think actually um, our state treasurer, I'll, I'll give him credit where credit's due, he had this fantastic webinar not long ago. Uh, and the title of it was based off of a book whose author he came on in, you know, Homelessness is a Housing Problem, yep. which I think is, is something that's extremely lost on a lot of individuals in this current debate. Yeah, I mean, and we can't forget the connection that homelessness has with like general poverty. And again, we're seeing this is a wage issue as well of like we've got a shortage of people to fill jobs we've got a shortage of um, again it, it just all comes back to like we do need people here mm -hmm. but the problem is we have nowhere to put them yes um, and the big question is how are we gonna solve that issue um, which you know you and I talk a lot about this but like we're not gonna build our way out of it there's gonna have to be some other reforms to support the market yeah. um, other than just like the solution is not build new housing like that is not the end-all be-all solution it has to be one piece of the puzzle yeah so let's talk let's talk about um reforms of our our housing sure. i mean i think you know we hit, touched on act 250 um a while back and uh, in the earlier in the conversation and what we found is, you know, this is uh, a land use law that has stymied growth for 50 years and to a large extent has kind of accomplished what it set out to not do, mm -hmm. which is create sprawl. Um, and I think, you know, for me, when I think about the epitome of that, it, it comes down to what's called the 1055 rule. I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. So the 1055 rule is um, a portion of the legislation that says you can't you can only build 10 houses within five years within five miles of each other so when you think about like a traditional suburban neighborhood that's typically more than 10 houses <laughs> um, and we don't have a lot of those here um, and it's not necessarily houses it's like 10 units yeah. um, so I know there was a proposal to bump that number up to 25 um, and I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about how that played out, um, but, yeah, you know. I think that was really scary for a lot of folks, um, you know, and I think we we ended up, you know, getting something across the finish line in the legislative processes last session that allowed to go to 25 or 24 um, in 
limited areas. Uh, we're talking about 0.5% of the state's overall land mass. And um, I think we need to go much bigger and bolder than that if we're gonna start hitting yeah. our targets. Um, you know, and you think about that from an incentive perspective. And when you say you can't do more than 10 units within five years, within five miles, um, you know, unless and you're automatically going into Act 250 if you don't. And, you know, Act 250 is notorious for adding additional time, energy, and cost. So I was looking into this a little bit as someone sort of new to the area within the last year or so, and I found um, there was a number, granted this is from 2017, so many years old at this point um, in terms of the rate of inflation, um, but it said that an Act 250 review process could add up to, if not more than $50,000 to the cost of the home. Wow. Um, and that prices out so many people, you yeah. know? Like, especially with the interest rates that we're seeing right now, like the 50,000 extra dollars is the difference between, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the mathematician here, <laughs> let's be clear. Um, but that is, that's like a significant difference in your monthly mortgage payment oh, yeah. and, and uh, your down payment. Like, and, and your tax bill. And your tax forward. bill, yeah. Uh, you know, I think anyone who's ever bought a home can tell you the difference between, you know, uh, what that $50,000 can make. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that certainly just gets rolled into the overall long-term price of, of rental units too. Yep. And so all of it, you know, does go back to this. But back to my incentives point, you know, if you know that you might be adding $50,000 per unit um, on this project, you're going to try to avoid that. You're going to try to get it lo that market rate lower. And so what you're telling a developer is, tell you what, build nine units and then maybe wait five years. And then we'll talk. And we'll talk again. Or go five miles down the road. Right. So, you know, what we've really seen and I think you know you talk to a lot of I, I remember I was working um, this at the Center for Research of Vermont many years ago and um, one study they did was they asked Vermonters you know describe sprawl I was gonna ask you it's like I feel like we need to define what that is because we know what that is but for the purposes of the, this conversation like put a definition on it yeah, and the funny thing was a lot of folks, once they define sprawl, they'd be asked, is, sprawl, is your community sprawling? And a lot of the folks in these our, our local communities would say no. <laughs> and then they'd kind of go back and say, well, by your definition, we do have sprawl. And sure. I, think, I think that it's these little pockets of acreage that provide you know, the agrarian feeling lifestyle that folks move yeah. to Vermont for, or many folks do. Um, that doesn't necessarily feel like sprawl, but when you take a larger step back, you realize, you know, my my home on a dirt road at the end of another dirt road is, is contributing to the sprawl at the end of the day. Well, and an important factor of all this, too, is like Act 250, my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, was designed with some environmental concerns in mind. And sprawl is not environmentally friendly, yeah. right? Like if you're in a community, if you live at the end of a dirt road, you have to get in a car and drive wherever you're going. You're not necessarily taking public transportation. You're not walking to the grocery store that's 15 miles away, right? So you're contributing to your carbon footprint goes up. Um, and I mean, I would argue that sprawl has a big factor in carbon emissions, right? Because we, you, you got to have a car. Yeah. And I think it, it goes back to, uh, you know, and then on the other side of things, it's expensive to develop in our downtowns. Sure. That's where the majority of the regulatory burden is. Um, a lot of the sites in our downtowns are need to be some kind of remediated. They might they're brownfields, which means at one point in time, there was some kind of contamination of that soil. So you need to mitigate that before you ever start. Um, and it, it's just difficult to actually build in our downtowns. And I, that leads back to each of our organizations' respectively long-term goal, which is removing some of these downtowns um, from Act 250 jurisdiction. Yeah. The ones that have shown that they have rigorous regulatory environments that can handle the work of Act 250, the work that wasn't done by any municipality when Act 250 was created, they can handle it and they can do it at a local level, which ironically is a bit of a Vermont value, but we don't allow it often. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I'm excited to see a couple of studies that are going on. Um, there's 
and I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are looking at the progression, but currently right now, um, due to a, a bill that passed last year, Act 47, there are four separate studies going on. And I urge anyone watching to, to plug into these. Um, the Natural Resources Board is undertaking a study and they're looking at so many factors, I don't think it's worth listing, but hmm. what they're coming out to is, is and what it lo might look like is a tiered system where communities based off the place, based off of their regulation, our uh, uh, municipalities are, are, are going to see different levels of review. Um, we might actually be able to see downtowns like Burlington be able to do their own review and yeah. operate on their own, still acknowledging all the criteria and whatnot of Act 250, but doing it at their local level. And then I think there's going to be f some areas in the state that um, will likely look a lot like um, Act 250 currently is, with some revisions. And then I think there will be some areas in the state that folks will actually increase jurisdictional thresholds. Mm -hmm. And um, ironically, those are areas that Act 250 was always meant to protect and maybe didn't do the best job protecting. Right. Um, you know, some of these places in more vulnerable areas. We're talking about really about 18% of the state. Um, so that's a really exciting kind of component of how the, uh, the natural resources boards using their time. And then um, there's a designation study, which if uh, I believe the, the website is designation2050.org. If you want to take a look at that, um, we can post that in the description of this video. There's a summit next week uh, on Tuesday, if, and there's some other opportunities to engage. But this is about the designation programs for different cities and towns across the state that allow for um, revitalization and tax credits for things like, um, you know, mixed use development and flood mitigation, which is very, very on the tip of our mm -hmm. tongues this, uh, this session, I mean, this uh, summer. And, um, you know, they're looking at how do they make those designations have a little bit more oomph? Mm -hmm. How can we look at places like Burlington and say, okay, you know, actually the fact that they've achieved this designation means that maybe they don't need Act 50 or places like Winooski that's had tremendous, fantastic, smart growth over the last few years. It's really Opportunity City for Vermont. And then, um, you know, the other two things, and I'll kind of stop being so long-winded about it, but it's just some advanced planning. Um, I was going to, you know, I'll jump in and say that while I don't think a lot of the consequences of the regulation that we have currently were intentional, we are going to have to be extremely intentional with how we rectify our issues. Yeah. Um, we're going to have to take these studies and do something with the information because um, you I mean you see this all the time of like okay well like let's get some information let's get some data on that great and then it gets kind of pushed what down do do? the what do, what do we do, do with, with that it? data yeah. let's and take I, more you know, data out of it <laughs> right right and I think that's it's so important to like take okay yes we know this is an issue we now have the numbers to prove that this yep. is an issue let's be very intentional with how we do this in an inclusive way that provides more access for people who've traditionally been knocked out of the housing market. And I think that's what's exciting about some of the work that's been mandated mm -hmm. um, this last session for the Vermont Association of Planners and uh, Development Agencies. And uh, what they're looking at is mapping the state, uh, which you know I think is always kind of one of the original um, goals under Act 250 that just kind of got forgotten, yeah. you know? It was one of those, like... It's a big piece of legislation. Easy to forget things. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> well, I mean, it was one of those things. It was, it was always the intention. Um, but it should be easy to look at a map somewhere and say, okay, these are volatile areas. These are uh, sensitive ecological areas. Don't touch them. These are areas that have storm water and sewer water and... Uh, and uh, fantastic electrical utilities and public transit, these are places we should put development. Exactly. And once we have some of that, like, you know, inventorying of our resources as a state, my hope is um, we can have more educated conversations yeah. and we can actually make um, much of this conversation um, place oriented and realistic in, in its expectations. So you can kind of see all these three studies that I mentioned are all kind of braiding together. And the hope is that, you know, before December even, we have a nice idea of how they've all braided together. 
and we can use the work of the planners and developing agencies and we can use the work of the existing designation programs and, and how folks want to re-envision that uh, and then put that into uh, how the Natural Resources Board wants to handle some locations and we can start to have it so that we can build more housing in the places that it needs to be. Yep. Um, and I think it's important to remember and to remind our, like ourselves and everyone, nobody wants us to build lock, stock and barrel, no holds barred, wherever you want to build, yeah. you can build. Like nobody wants that, right? Uh, well, somebody probably does want that. There's but people who want that. <laughs> there are people who want but that. But they're not on this show. They're not for on this show. Reason. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to like, the concept of, there's going to be new housing near my house. Yeah. What does that mean for traffic? What does that mean for the crowding at my grocery store? What does that mean for my daily life? What does that mean for my backyard? What does that mean for my backyard? <laughs> and I, we need more people not to be a total cornball, but like we need more people to say, yes, I want this here. Yeah. Um, because it does have benefit for everyone. Um, and living in that community, living in a community that is more connected is, is good for people. We. Um, our association did a polling project, and it wasn't in Chittenden County, it was in Franklin and Grand Isle, um, where we asked registered voters about um, their preferences and, you know, what type of housing do you want to see developed? And it was clear that there was t there's tension between, like, yes, I see that housing cost and housing availability is an issue, but I don't want it here. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a big barrier, um, especially in the Act 250 process because of the public comment um, and public review yeah, process. And, and really, you know, the, I think the thing we even hit on here is that Act 250 does create this just war of attrition. It's yeah. about how long can you drag it out. But the longer you drag it out, the more you're adding costs. Yeah. Because, you know, with enough time and patience most people can get at through what point do you give at what point do you give up though you know if you face barriers well i think i think the issue with act 250 when we talk to legislators is um there's there is that question of like what point do you give up and it, it's you know the people point to their oh we don't see many people give up most act 250 permits go through to completion and it's like at what cost literally that was the thing i was going to say was at and what cost the yeah. second side of that is who never tried mm -hmm. because they've seen that cost. They've seen that time and energy expended. And, if you're and they said, not worth it. And if you're <clears throat> a developer, I think another, you know, speaking of cost, um, I don't have the hard data on this, but I would assume that if you are a developer looking at, okay, I can build 24, let's just say we bump it up to 2555. I can build 24 units. That's gonna change how you cost your materials. Mm -hmm. It's gonna change how you cost your contractors. Like it does, the buy in bulk mentality is not always the best, but it does have, I mean, it is, it is part of the conversation, you know, of, okay, but if I had to start at nine, take a pause, do nine again, like it's, yeah. I think that's a, well, we're coming, yeah. we're coming up at two minutes, uh, and so I want to get your final thoughts, but I want to put a finer point on what we were kind of just getting at, and that is, you know, what we need is Vermonters to start looking at the current housing situation with a less myopic lens. And what we need folks to look at is that we do need some growth. We have pushed back growth to try to stay to our agrarian bucolic roots as long as possible. However, it's, we're at a point of emergency. Um, we're not gonna have the nurses and doctors or the EMTs or firefighters. Or the teachers. Or the teachers. Or even the baristas and or the, the servers or anybody. We're not gonna have them if we don't do something yeah. and do something soon. Um, and, uh, you know, we need everyone to start looking at it that way. And, um, you know, if you would like to plug into these efforts, uh, my Email is just austin at vermont.org, and I don't know if you want to share yours. Sure. Mine is uh, troy at nwvtrealtor.org. And uh, certainly want to plug you in. Reach out to your legislators. Let them know that housing is an issue of concern for you um, and that you want to be a welcoming state, a state that says, come here, do great things, join our community. Um, because to say no to housing is to say no to new Vermonters at the end of the day. 
Is there anything else you want to leave us with? It's been a fantastic Gosh, well, conversation. Well, that really, <laughs> you said it better than, be, better than I can. But yeah, I'll just give a plug for um, definitely it is important to be engaged with all aspects of your community. And at this point, broad housing goals is what builds our community, right? Um, we want people to feel included here. And, you know, that's something I certainly love about Vermont. That's something that made Vermont really attractive to me and my family was it seems like a welcoming place. And so let's make that true with our housing. Um, mm. And you've got to engage with your legislators and kind of keep keep an eye on that. Um, and uh, that's that's probably what I would say. <laughs> Nothing says you're welcome here like a healthy housing inventory. And you know what? That's exactly <laughs> right. Let's change our slogan. <laughs> so let's leave it at that for today. Again, I'm Austin Davis with the Lake Champlain Chamber. And thank you, Troy, for joining for this. For having me. Uh, and uh, have a great evening, folks.